which is an ancient lineage from Gondwan and origin or so-called primary freshwater fishes. They include uh, familiar forms like catfishes, uh, tetras, uh, the electric fishes from uh, South America. Uh, and there's other groups that form an array of diverse forms also that are more of more recent marine ancestry. So the interplay between freshwaters and uh, marine habitats uh, is known to be pretty important to shape macroevolutionary and microevolutionary patterns of diversity. Um, so fishes in general, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about these two groups uh, briefly today, two stories, one about catfishes and one about uh, silver side. Uh, fishes in general live in any body of water uh, from, uh, from a very uh, uh, diverse uh, composition uh, or uh, even ephemeral habitats. But the major distinction we can make is, of course, between uh, marine habitats and freshwater habitats. If we look at the proportion of these uh, in, around the world, we see that only 30% of the surface area is covered by freshwaters, and uh, this is a very small part of the total volume of water. And marine habitats on the other side are the vast majority of the, uh, of the planet. But if we look at the number of fish species that live in each of these environments, we see that about 50% out of the 30,000 or so uh, living species are split evenly among these, these environments. Um, uh, this led to the question of why so few species in the sea, as uh, a paper by uh, Vega and Weems uh, published a few years ago. Uh, uh, sort of straightforward explanation is that as opposed to the vast uh, natural connectivity in the ocean, uh, freshwater habitats are naturally fragmented and, and heterogeneous, promoting genetic divergence, speciation, so on, which is uh, makes up for the, for the lack of, um, of, of, of surface of, and volume. But um, the uh, distinction between these habitats is, is pretty steep. It's actually one of the strongest ecological gradients that you can, that you can uh, possibly find in nature. And it's due to these uh, parameters or uh, issues here, like salt concentration, which is uh, obviously high in the sea and uh, low in fresh water. Uh, temperature and uh, especially the biotic factors such as uh, the um, uh, species that are present which are could be competitors or predators, parasites, or even if we uh, go finer and finer we can uh, characterize the microbiomes could be very different in these two environments. In fact, the greatest gradient of microbiome is between marine and freshwater habitats. So, of course, the um, way to understand the effect of these uh, gradients and the uh, transitions among these gradients uh, is uh, in, in terms of fish diversity is, is uh, obviously we have to start with our phylogeny. So if we look at the distribution of the raven fishes across these environments, in red you see uh, the groups that are found in the marine environments and in blue are the uh, freshwater ones. Um, what we see is like there's a sort of even distribution across the, the phylogeny of fishes, but uh, there's uh, some interesting patterns that also emerge. Uh, basically, that the uh, um, uh, sort of early groups seem to be represented by blue, so they're freshwater, uh, and the uh, most recent groups over here are uh, mostly represented by, by red or, or, or marine habitat. So, uh, we did a uh, ancestral habitat reconstruction, including fossils, and uh, I'll just briefly give you the, the, the bottom line of what we uh, think this uh, study uh, produced uh, uh, in a second, uh, and, and it, it relates to uh, two things. One is, uh, well, the uh, number of transitions that occur and the rates of these transitions. We see that predominantly what we, what we find is that there's marine to freshwater transitions are, are higher than the reverse and that the diversification rate is, is higher in, in, in the oceans than, than there is in, in, in the fresh waters. So uh, another interesting pattern, if you look at the tree again, is that um, these ancient groups 
uh, or the early lineages are represented by blue or they are uh, uh, fresh water, whereas the recent ones, as I said, are, are marine. Um, and what we think this means is that the, uh, um, basically there's this uh, hypothesis that we came up with or people have talked about is that the freshwater habitats harbor the sort of ancient lineages. The old lineages survive in, long, in, in, in fresh waters when they are able to colonize and establish themselves over long periods of time. Uh, they're hard to get rid of. They, they, they just stick there and, and nothing else can invade and, and replace them. Whereas if you are in the uh, ocean, it's a more aggressive and competitive environment and you know, things come and snap you and, and, and uh, the turnover is much higher in the sea. So all the recent lineages and the highest diversity of lineages in the sea is much more recent than the diversity in, in the fresh waters. So when we think about habitat transitions, uh, we can, we can uh, ask uh, quite a few questions. So how, how these things happen, when these things happen, uh, more deeply, why? Uh, and uh, what I'm gonna talk about today mostly is uh, perhaps when, because we're gonna see two different groups that uh, uh, experience transitions at different times in, in geological history, and then what happens once these transitions occur, uh, what's, what's the consequence? Um, so there, there's been a lot of talk about ecological opportunities when new lineages invade new habitats, they can diversify, and, and this may have an effect on, on the macroevolutionary patterns. Uh, uh, there's uh, some discussion about that in, in this talk also. The first one is a, a story about catfishes, and this is developing. Catfish is, uh, everybody knows a catfish. They're very uh, unique. They, they, you can see they have these uh, barbels, and the uh, barbels are loaded with this, uh, sensitive organs that they can detect smell, and, and, uh, and uh, they can detect their environments. They have relatively tiny eyes. They're, they're nocturnal mostly, so they're the night shift among the fishes, and they can exploit the habitats during the night when other fishes are sleeping, and other people are, or, or organisms are also sleeping. Catfishes also have spines. These spines are, are very uh, uh, strong and they also carry uh, venom glands, most of them. So uh, they are formidable defense mechanisms that uh, allow them to uh, you know, uh, survive for, uh, against, against predators. There's about 3,000 species of catfish. They're distributed worldwide, mostly in fresh water. There's only two marine families. Uh, but again, the interesting thing is that they are in all continents, even fossils were found in, in Antarctica. Uh, so how did they get there? Of course, we need, we need the phylogeny for this. This was back almost 10 years ago, a uh, summary of the state of the art of uh, higher level phylogeny, <laughs> which uh, as you can see is not very well resolved. And <laughs> controversy and uh, even more controversy with uh, with other studies, so of course uh, we, we are interested in uh, inferring phylogeny and um, this is what we did. This is uh, sort of the, the, the strongest molecular phylogeny until we started with this project, uh, published in 2006 <coughs> by, by the uh, catfish gurus, uh, John Sullivan, Lundberg, and Mike Harman, and, and they found that this is sort of the, 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 the basal part of the tree with, with um, so these groups, you can see in red, the colors are, are included by continent. The red is South America. Uh, so all the uh, sort of early lineages are red, uh, the Loricaroids, Diplomistes, and then this big group, which is really hard to resolve, the Siluroides, are in all these different continents, including red, uh, South America, and, and all the other continents. So well, we attempted to resolve this with uh, phylogenomic markers. This is part of a, uh, a bigger effort called the Fish Life Project funded by National Science Foundation. We published our first uh, uh, data set with uh, uh, exon markers, about 1,000 loci, 250,000 base pairs. So this study, I'm just showing the part of the catfish phylogeny. Uh, it included 79 taxa. We then, uh, this was published in 2017, since then we increased the number of catfishes for, for, for this particular study and uh, produced a phylogeny with a, about 110. And this is just the preliminary, that's why I say developing um, story because we're really increasing this to about 400 or 500 taxa in, in the next year or so. Um, so we do get some resolution in, 
in the celluloid eight plate, and this is the interesting part of the story. You still see that all the uh, sort of early lineages are red, they're uh, South American lineages. Uh, but the interesting result is this clay here, which we call OSAF clay, the out of South American freshwater clays, that implies a freshwater to marine habitat tra tra uh, transition and therefore dispersal away from South America to colonize the world, okay? So talk about ecological opportunities. These catfishes could invade every continent that was catfish naive. Nobody was using the <laughs> night shift and, and they can, can, could get in there and, and, and colonize and speciate all over the world. The, the date is, again, is tentative, but the date of this uh, split here is around 100 or so million years ago. If you look at the uh, distribution of the continents, you can see that they're uh, pretty close together, uh, allowing these shallow epicontinental seas through which the catfish could uh, uh, disperse and invade uh, the other continents. But except the Australia, sorry, Australia and, and uh, New Guinea were, were sort of isolated and just became colonized very recently by one of the living families of marine catfish, the Areids. So with all due respect, I need to um, uh, confess that this result was really uh, already obtained by my colleagues, uh, Sullivan and, and Lundberg, back uh, like uh, on more 10 years ago, based on only two genes. They never <laughs> dared publish this because the bootstrap support for the trade was 3% or something like that. So they refrained from publishing it, but they did give a talk at a, at a meeting with this big bang theory of celeroid global diversification, as I said, uh, years ago. So I think we, with this new data set, we're now in a position to say, yes, this seems to be like a well-supported hypothesis, and we're elaborating this biogeographic scenario to explain the diversity of catfish in all uh, continents around the, the, uh, the globe. So the uh, second story is, is about the South American silver sites. Um, the group that we're focusing on here it is uh, distributed in two genera, Basilictis has only three species, and Orontestes has about 19. They're in the family of Therinopsidae. The uh, sister family of these guys here in South America are North Americans, so they're amphitropical distributed, so Guaranians that live off the coast of California are the sister group to this group here. So our interest was in resolving the relationships among these species and try to understand the, again, um, habitat transitions that explain their diversity in fresh waters and, and in, in, in marine habitat. The, out of the 19 species, there are seven marine and the rest are, are fresh water in the use of tests. So when we started, we had a morphological hypothesis for the group uh, that you see here. And the, the funny thing about this, this hypothesis was that all or most of the marine species are confined to these uh, derived clays, which implies a sort of a sort of freshwater ancestry similar to what we just saw with the catfish. Uh, although uh, this is a more recent group, and as you will see, the calibration talk about 10 to 5 million years uh, from, from today. So briefly, we uh, and uh, colleagues went, uh, had a lot of fun sampling all these uh, fish in South America, several trips to Patagonia and Buenos Aires, and our colleague from Brazil provided the key samples from there, and we um, used uh, rat seek data and cytochrome B data uh, for a lot of individuals to compare these two markers and, and come up with a phylogeny. The phylogenetic relationships among these taxa based on molecules, based on cytochrome B or uh, 